It was just one of those things you stumble on. In a long, forgotten documentary on African music, a band is playing. What is this math rock? I thought to myself. But then, about a minute in, something changes. A bold guitarist steps forward, weaving in and out of rhythm with his frenetic chops. But as soon as he lures you in, he changes patterns, shifting to the offbeat. I'm completely hooked, as is the audience, who suddenly look like they're moshing at a Fugazi concert. So what is this music? Who is this band? My question was answered moments later by a pop-up on the screen. But little did I know, the mystery was only beginning. Zani Jabate and the Super Jata Band are virtually unknown outside West Africa with only a few out-of-print books and a few savvy bloggers mentioning their name. And yet, they have a vast discography of incredible psychedelic guitar music. Their story is part of a larger movement in history, when West African countries were gaining independence and newly formed governments were sponsoring bands. Free from colonial oversight and stocked with government-provided gear, these bands recorded some truly out-of-the-box stuff. And while this pushes some of the same buttons for me as Jimi Hendrix or the OCs, it's really in a league of its own. The sounds, rhythms, and guitar riffs are all based on traditional music. Even using words like psychedelic to describe it is a bit improper. But let's be real, just about everyone here is coming from a background of Western music. So if you want your mind blown in the same way it was when you first heard King Crimson or Maggot Brain, then allow me to be your guide. While most of the bands I'm going to share are from the country of Mali, the story actually begins in Guinea. In 1958, France asked each of their African colonies to hold a referendum, deciding by popular vote if they wished to remain a French territory. Overwhelmingly, the colonies voted yes, except for one outlier. In the colony of Guinea, the people rejected the proposition by an almost 20 to 1 vote. They were riding a wave of independence fever that was led by this man, Sekou Toure, then mayor of Guinea's largest city, and soon to be their first president. Toure was fiercely idealistic. He decried the replacement of Guinea's traditional culture in terms of language, education, art, and music. How many young men and young girls have lost the taste for our traditional dances and popular songs? He asked in a 1959 speech. Instead, they've become fans of such flashy Western genres as the tango or the waltz. Scandalous indeed. At the time of independence, there wasn't a single group in the capital city which played Guinean music or sang in Guinean languages. And this presented a problem for Toure. You see, when France left once and for all, they brought all their equipment, infrastructure, and expertise with them. Toure knew that economic downturn was inevitable, but music would be his secret weapon. Music would keep the nation unified and inspired. One of his first orders was to disband all existing music groups in the country and ban all foreign music from the radio. In its place, he created a network of government-sponsored orchestras, one for each of the 35 regions of Guinea, plus a national group in the capital where the best musicians would be invited to join. <laughs> With a catchphrase of, look at the past, 
Toure called on each orchestra to explore the traditional music of their region, modernizing them with saxophones, drum kits, and electric guitars purchased from Italy. Lyrically, the songs were to sing the praises of Toure and his party, the PDG. <laughs> For the musicians of Guinea, it was a double-edged sword. On the one hand, they had to submit to censorship by a government that would soon turn quite oppressive. On the other hand, they had the opportunity to explore creative realms that were previously closed off and make a good living doing it. For the first time, the storytelling tradition of the griot was electrified and captured in high fidelity. Écoutez aussi Jeanne d'Afrique, espoir de demain. Écoutez tous une page de la glorieuse histoire africaine. The ngoni, the bluesy precursor to the banjo, was recreated on electric guitar. The traditional harp, the kora, was accompanied by horns and a Cuban rhythm. Now, if there's one word that caught your attention, it was probably Cuban. The door may have been closed to Western music, but with Cuba, it was wide open. So much so that the famous Guinean band, Bembea Jazz, were even sent there to study music. After all, many Cuban rhythms originated in Africa, and the term Afro-Cuban is usually applied to avoid debate over who invented what. Even before Guinea's revolution, you had Ghanaian high life. Welcome to Ghana. Welcome to and Congolese rumba, popularizing this Afro-Cuban blend. But look, I know what you're here for. I promised you some wild, fuzzy, psychedelic goodness. So for the next leg of this journey, we're going to shift to Guinea's neighbor to the north. But first, if you're a fan of this channel, there's a decent chance you're a musician yourself. Well, friend of the channel and sponsor of this video, World Music Method, has created the single best learning platform for niche world music genres, including some of the African guitar methods you're seeing in this video. Courses are taught by real experts, like the legendary Via Farca Torre. I sat in on one of these lessons and can confirm it's the real deal. Check out the link in the description to explore the current available courses. All right, and back to the story. <laughs> when Mali became independent in 1960, they followed in Guinea's footsteps by establishing government-funded bands. One such group, sponsored by the National Railway Company, was aptly named Rail Band. They too wrote praise songs for the new government. However, they were given considerably more freedom to explore non-traditional influences as well. Rail Band's lead vocalist was Salif Keita, who would go on to be a world-famous singer. Although this track featured lead vocals by Maury Kante, Salif has stated in interviews that the band listened to music from everywhere, from Guinea to South Africa, from James Brown to the Beatles. But his intense vocal delivery was not taken from R&B. It's a tradition that goes back generations, as are the call and response backing vocals. Now that scream, that may have been from James Brown. Like in Guinea, regional groups were sponsored across Mali. One that stands out in particular is Super Beaton from Segu. They started as a jazz orchestra before independence, but now we're heeding the call to incorporate traditional influences. <laughs> I 
baby. Now, personally, tracks like this one off their 1977 release are where I totally lose my frame of reference. There's horns, but they don't sound Cuban. There's electric guitar, but the shimmering arpeggios sound nothing like rock. The vocals weave around them mysteriously. After a few minutes, the guitar jumps forth. It remains a rhythmic instrument marching along the pentatonic scale, yet it breaks in and out of the pattern beautifully. It's a zen-like moment that leaves me with goosebumps. So what is this music? To answer that, let's get back to our main characters, Zani Jabate and the Super Jata Band. Zani was born in 1947 in the Sikasso region of Mali. Biographical details are sparse, but we do know that, by the age of 16, he had relocated to the capital, Bamako, where he joined Mali's National Ballet, the independence-era dance group that was created to celebrate regional music and act as cultural ambassadors to other countries. <laughs> While his roles in the band were limited to dancing and playing the djembe, Zani was a multi-instrumentalist. He played harmonica, accordion, and guitar. Since he had a bit of downtime from his touring schedule with the National Ballet, Zani decided to start a private orchestra on the side, along with fellow ballet members Alufane and Dauda Sangare. This group would eventually become the Super Jata Band. Their first recordings came in 1974, although they weren't commercially released until 1980, perhaps due to Mali's lack of a record plant. <laughs> Immediately, you hear a deeply hypnotic groove, with Zani's guitar intermittently bouncing in and out of step. The album explores a range of territory, including a song in the Malinke style, and the slow and brooding Farima. Which eventually breaks out. So let's quit dodging the question. What is this music? If you ask their record label, Kindred Spirits, they'll describe it as follows. Bringing together Bambara traditions, Wasulu hunter music, Kenadugu's balafone music, Bozo fisherman dances, Mandingo chants, solo repertoire, mixed with a spicy and at times even psychedelic guitar. It would take a dissertation to fully unpack this. So instead, we're gonna ask for some help. Mariam is a performer of many different styles of Malian music, and currently singer of the band Orchestra Gold. She explained to me that while Super Jata Band did record in a wide variety of styles, they're primarily considered to be Bamana. Aha! You see, Mali is home to many different ethnic groups. And oftentimes, Malian music is categorized in terms of which ethnic group it originates from. If we go back to the kindred spirits explanation, many of these are ethnicities. However, Bamana or Bambara is the most dominant one. I also spoke with Stefan, who runs the blog World Service and was a personal friend of the band. He tried to dissuade me from seeking a simple categorical term. Instead, he said, one should focus on each individual song. For example, oftentimes Zani is using his guitar to recreate traditional instruments, such as the bass-like Donso Ngoni. <laughs> or the xylophone-like balafone. His way of weaving around the rhythm when soloing is reminiscent of patterns on a djembe. According to Stefan, some of Zani's biggest influences were Franco Luambo, the Congolese rumba master. 
as well as Seku Jabate from Bembea Jazz. He was aware of Western rock, and he liked the effects used by Jimi Hendrix, but otherwise wasn't much of a connoisseur of his music. Now I have to admit, it's hard for me to unhear the connection to rock music completely. For example, on the opening track to Super Jata Band's 1985 record, Zani is noodling downward on a pentatonic scale before ending on a major third chord. It's a move that reminds me of this song from Cream. But it could just be a coincidence. After all, Cream is based on the blues, and the blues is based on the music of Molly. So... I think ultimately, we have to take Stefan's advice and admit there's no easy way to categorize this. Maybe we can call it Bamana Psych Funk, Bamba Wasulu Fuzz, Bamana Psychedelic Dream Funk. Eh, we'll just leave it. Throughout the early 80s, the Super Jata Band released several LPs, with many oddly being named Volume 2, despite containing entirely different music. Some standouts include Authentic 81, which includes the track named after Zani, seen here performs live. Or this track off in super form. I find myself getting lost in that repeating guitar motif and not even realizing it's been 11 minutes. In 1985, the band would release their most ambitious and hi-fi album to date, recorded in Lyon, France at Studio du Manoir. This was also their first record to attract attention in the U.S., where writers were equally dumbfounded on how to explain it. That makes me feel better. Some standouts from this record include the aforementioned track, Super Jata, as well as the song that led off this video. But I have to admit that, overall, it doesn't grab me in the same way as their earlier recordings, or their wild live videos. In crisp digital quality, the guitar feels weaker, the space emptier, and suddenly the moments where the vocals get a little off-key become more obvious. On the other hand, take one of their live videos playing on the streets of Bamako. Or this live recording from Amsterdam. There's just so much energy. It's chilling. The Super Jata Band did a lot of touring in the mid-80s. Their biggest show was probably at the Music Matisse Festival in Angoulême, France, where they played for several thousand people. However, touring internationally with such a large band was not very profitable. Even after playing a major festival like this, the band would return home to mud houses. By the late 80s, the era of large orchestras was cresting. Mali's economy was in decline. Government support began drying up. And even though Super Jata Band was privately funded, the subsequent shift in music tastes made their large ensemble unsustainable. The 1985 record would be Super Jata Band's last. Although Zani would continue releasing music on his own, including a 1991 album with vocals from Dawada. Zani would also return to the National Ballet, the place where his career began, but this time as the leader. Not to mention a stint as Mali's Minister of Culture. Co-vocalist Alufane passed away in 1994, 
But Zani and Dawada would continue performing together well into the 2000s. <laughs> Sadly, Dawada Sangare would pass away shortly after in January 2008. And three years later, while recording in Paris, Zani himself would pass away after suffering a fatal stroke. He was 63 years old. The record he was working on was released posthumously. I asked Mariam and her bandmate Eric about the legacy Super Jata Band has in Mali today. While they remain popular, their particular blend of, um, bomb and a psych funk is a bit of a relic. Today, popular music in Mali is as diverse as anywhere. There's rap, there's reggae, and there's still a lot of traditional music. Now based in the U.S., Mariam and Eric's band, Orchestra Gold, takes a lot of influence from Super Jata Band and the orchestra music of the 70s. They fuse these sounds with fuzzed out psych rock, infiltrating a secret dose of Malian music into the ears of American festival goers. <laughs> And this is all not to mention the long tradition of brilliant guitar music that Mali continues to export, whether it's Tenariwen, Via Farcatore, or Sonhoi Blues, which, oh hey, what do you know, we have videos on as well. Check the links in the description below, and you know the drill, like, subscribe, you know you want a notification the next time a video comes out. Alright, thanks for watching.